This is a production of Cornell University. Outlined in the Morrell Land Grant Acts of 1862 and 1890, the land grant mission was not only about agricultural development, but about changing the world in positive, meaningful ways and creating greater opportunity for all. Today, the essence of the land grant is in its mission of service and service-minded leadership, providing a liberal and relevant education, whether that be crafting the undergraduate academic experience, stimulating research, or engaging with the community through extension activities. In a 2015 book talk at Mann Library, presented as part of Cornell's sesquicentennial anniversary celebration, Cornell Professor of Human Development Robert Sternberg draws from his new book, The Modern Land Grant University, to reflect on the land grant mission in 21st century context and highlight the challenges that today's land grant universities face in an increasingly competitive higher education environment. So we're going to hear from Bob Sternberg, the Modern Land Grant University, and I think it's very um, perfect timing. So it's President's Day weekend coming up. Students are going to get a little break. Um, and um, while President Lincoln didn't very, you know, is very well known for, for obvious things, what's not as well known is that he was the signer of the Morrill Act that actually established the land grant university system. And so it's very fitting that the Cornell Library is having a feature on Lincoln as we speak. And um, here we are celebrating um, President's um, Weekend with um, Bob Sternberg, who is talking about the modern version of what Lincoln saw as such an important thing. And as Cornell celebrates its 150th um, birthday, its sesquicentennial, it's, it's great opportunity for the college to reflect on its legacy um, and its contributions to Cornell's history. So it's, it's all coming together perfectly with Bob. So a little bit about Bob, I could spend an hour and a half talking about this, but um, Bob is a prolific author, um, considered one of the top psychologists of the 21st century, and I'm not saying that lightly. Um, he comes with both um, incredible research scholarship and also huge administrative experience. So he's seen both the product of land-grant universities and helped administer and help contribute both from research and helped administer them. So he was, comes, comes to us from being the president of the University of Wyoming. Um, he was um, provost and vice president at Oklahoma State University. And then he, prior to that, he was dean of arts and sciences at Tufts University. So um, I remember getting about a year and a half ago, maybe, I got a call from um, the chair of human development talking about this amazing opportunity we have to recruit Bob to Cornell. And um, we were so, so thrilled to have him join join the faculty. He adds such um, great deep scholarship and, and um, perspective to human development, to psychology more broadly at Cornell. And again, it's, it's, it's really wonderful to have Bob. His research is very eclectic. Um, so his interests are in intelligence, creativity, wisdom, thinking styles, leadership, ethics, and love and hate, just a few things, hopefully more on the love side than the hate side, but um, he has been the past president of the American Psychological Association. I could go on and on and on. Um, I think what tells it all is that he holds 13 honorary doctorates from 11 different countries, so if that doesn't summarize it. And then in academic parlance of, of currency, um, we have these um, measures of both number of publications, H indices, and, and these types of things. And Bob is one, again, over 1,500 publications and one of the most cited authors in all of social sciences. So um, it's really my great, great pleasure to hand the floor over Thank to you. Bob Sternberg. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I was hoping we could keep this kind of informal, so if uh, you have any questions as I go along, you should feel free to ask them. Uh, I'm going to be talking nominally about a book I edited called The Modern Land Grant University, but because it has chapters by many different people, 
uh, I'll be kind of emphasizing my own point of view, which I think is consistent with many of the chapters, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, I spent, uh, just to open it with a little bit of personal background, uh, I spent 30 years of my career as a professor at Yale, uh, and I had a really good time there. It was a great place. Uh, my two adult children went there. Uh, but the whole time there was kind of a paradox for me personally in that I was at a great university uh, and the values of the institution seemed sort of odd given the kind of research I was doing. And the kind of research I was doing was on kids from backgrounds that you might call uh, challenging or uh, difficult uh, and trying to show that a lot of these kids had abilities that weren't being recognized by traditional kinds of tests or traditional kinds of educational institutions. So I was in a place that was great, but uh, I wasn't sure that the place was also consistent with my values, so I made some suggestions about how you know, the changes Yale might make and they didn't happen, and so then I moved on. Uh, and so what I want to talk about is uh, I spent f over 40 years in private institutions at Yale, and then I went to Stanford, and then I went back to Yale, and then I went to Tufts. And sort of the challenge for me was, uh, is there something missing here? And if so, what is it? And because I had spent all my life in private institutions, I wasn't quite sure what it was. And the conclusion I came to, uh, I went to Oklahoma State as a provost and senior vice president, there was that we really need to broaden our notion of what greatness in a university is. Uh, or at least we need to expand it in a multi-dimensional way and kind of get away from the US News and World Report mentality, which ranks institutions unidimensionally, you know, sort of from best to worst among universities or colleges or whatever. Uh, Land-grant institutions originally primarily emphasized uh, agriculture and mechanical um, occupations, and they still have a great emphasis on that, as they should. But what I see them fundamentally as a, being about is how we can develop students and faculty and staff to make a positive, meaningful, and enduring difference to the world. And so that's what I see as the essence of a land-grant university. That it's not, it's, yes, it is about having great scholarship and great teaching, but it really wants to make this positive difference to the world. So for me, uh, a land grant, and I think Lincoln felt the same way, is a kind of the core of what greatness is about. Uh, a land, some land grants like Cornell are seen as being among the so-called top universities in the country, uh, and some aren't, like Oklahoma State, except for uh, of course, athletics. Uh, but I think that the land grants, like Oklahoma State or uh, Texas A&M or whichever one you prefer, uh, have certain values that make them much greater than even people perceive them to be, and that would include Cornell. Uh, so I want to talk about what I see as those special values that you might not find in other institutions that are also very high up in the US news list. Um, Many private institutions that are great institutions in some state ones, when they admit students, they focus on entry value. So what they're looking at is how high are the SATs or the ACTs, how high are the grades, uh, how great are the extracurricular activities. But you're basically looking at a student in terms of entry value. And where I see land grants is differing is that their emphasis is more on value added. In other words, if we make an admissions decision, how much value can we add to the student and can this student add to the university and to the world? So typically, uh, land-grant institutions may take students with a broader range of SAT scores or ACT scores or grades uh, because their mission is to get the best students not only in terms of are their grades good and their SATs good, but who are the students who are going to make the university and the world a better place? And who are the students who are not just good, good scholars, but are going to be the future ethical leaders who will enrich their communities and societies? So difference number one is 
in some institutions, is this just a great student in terms of having the highest scores versus is this a student who's going to really add value, to whom we can add value and who can add value to us. Is that clear in terms of first difference? Uh, and I know uh, my first job after I graduated from college was to work in the admissions office at Yale. Uh, and really our focus was on that entry value, that we're getting the students who look to be at the top ra and less maybe on the value added. Uh, and again, that's not a criticism of the institution. It's a great institution at a wonderful time there. It's just what I think make, makes a land grant special. Uh, the second thing is that when you start to focus too much on entry value, it, it creates a funny kind of attitude in an admissions office. And that is, you see yourself as winning when you reject as many students as possible. Uh, so I re even during my days as a dean at Tufts, which puts a pretty substantial emphasis on leadership, often we were thinking in terms of, you know, we will look better if we reject more students, and because that looks good in a U.S. news kind of setting. And so what happens is that you get this perverse, or I think somewhat perverse mentality of rejecting a lot of people is good, rather than our goal is to provide opportunity. So, uh, so moving beyond sort of this value added thing, a second thing I think distinguishes land grant institutions is a different kind of brand equity from the brand equity you get when you go to an institution that's not a land grant. Uh, and some land grants don't, they don't all have the prestige of Cornell or the University of California, uh, but they, I see them as having a different kind of brand equity. And so if I go back in my own history, uh, I might have thought 20 years ago, oh, I'm really glad to be in arts and sciences. Uh, arts and sciences is, you know, very solid academia. And now coming to Cornell, I'm really happy to be in human ecology precisely because it's part of the land grant mission. Although uh, even in a place like Cornell, you can find some people in non-land grant portions of the university who might look at those as uh, the prestige entries. But the idea, I think, in a land grant is that we're providing opportunities. It's not just about sort of an exclusionary mentality, it's about providing opportunity. Uh, and we're going to take kids who might not look the best in terms of entry value, but we're going to give them opportunities they wouldn't have elsewhere. I think a third distinctive characteristic of land-grant institutions is that many of the most selective institutions in the country are organized around a fixed notion of abilities. In other words, it makes sense to put a lot of emphasis on SATs if you believe that abilities are fixed, because then it's like you could have uh, an SAT score sort of pasted on your head or branded on your head, uh, and that would tell you what you're capable of. Whereas I think that a land-grant institution is different, and that is it views abilities as modifiable. So that rather than saying uh, an SAT represents all that you potentially can do, they tend to emphasize what sometimes been called a zone of proximal development, and that is how can we take a student who we accept as a freshman and help that student progress, develop his or her abilities to the maximum extent possible. So that abilities, rather than being seen as, you know, the SATs or your grades or your extracurriculars or whatever it is, tells you what a person's capable of, uh, those are viewed as a starting point. And so you might have kids who come from backgrounds that are more challenging with a lower SATs, and you could legitimately say, well, given the kind of background they have, their potential may even be greater than somebody with higher scores because the potential for development is there. So the third difference is viewing abilities as fixed versus modifiable. Uh, I think a fourth distinctive characteristic of land-grant institutions is having a broad sense of what abilities are. Uh, and saying, well, a test like the ACT or the SAT may measure some abilities, 
but really they're kind of uh, they're kind of limited. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So when I was director of graduate studies in psychology at Yale, uh, there was a student who applied to our program who I'll call Alice, which wasn't her name. Uh, and she applied and she had sky high GREs and really good grades and great letters of recommendation. And we accepted her, of course, because everybody wants that kind of person. They look really good to have them in the class and you expect them to do well. So she was what an elite, a typical elite university would love to have, including us at Yale. I mean, I was very eager to admit her. Uh, and so Alice came into the program, and it wasn't like she was a total disaster. The first year she was there, she did really well. She was very good at taking courses and getting good grades. And that's really what the SAT and GRE predict, first year grades in school. Uh, the interesting thing about Alice is that by the time she graduated, she'd gone from being one of the top students in the program to being near the bottom, which is not something that happens that often. And I was kind of early in my career, and I asked, well, what happened with Alice? And I realized that what happened with Alice is we got kind of caught up in a somewhat narrow notion of abilities, which is what happens in many elite institutions. She really was good in memory and analytical skills, which is what SATs and ACTs and GREs and LSATs measure, but she just wasn't very creative. And in order to get through the graduate program, and actually much of the undergraduate program, there came a point where you had to transition from just remembering what other people said and analyzing what other people said to coming up with ideas of your own. And she just wasn't good at that. And I realized that to a large extent, what we were doing in admissions, even when I was director of graduate studies, so I'm not just blaming someone else, this was me, is we were taking kids who were socialized in a society that puts a really large emphasis on memory and analytical skills, but she just wasn't creative. Now you could say, well, you know, why wasn't she creative? Maybe she had bad genes for creativity. Uh, but I think there's a different reason, and that is our society has become so built around testing that it's not that Alice's are born that way, it's that we make them that way. And how we make them that way is we so much emphasize memory and analytical skills that the reward system is such that there's not much reason to develop creative thinking skills. Why should you? I mean, like, you, you know, if you're good at taking tests, it gets you into gifted programs, it gets you good grades, it gets you into good colleges and good graduate schools, then it gets you a good job and you do well your first year as an analyst and then it kind of falls apart. Uh, so our educational system is such that it creates Alice's and then rewards them in a way that I think is contrary to the spirit of the land grant which is why when I hear about land grants that just do admissions on the basis of grades and test scores, it really gets me distressed. Uh, in contrast, we had another student, Barbara, who applied to our graduate program in those days, and she had great letters of recommendation, just glowing letters of recommendation, and she published articles uh, which were really good, uh, and she was rejected. And the reason she was rejected is that her, her GREs kind of stank. And the truth is, I tried to get her in. You know, I, I said, look, this is a woman who has terrific creativity. Uh, you know, she has great letters, she's published articles. Uh, but when it came to the admissions committee, I figured, you know, I'm director of graduate studies, but listen to me, this is my field. I mean, people really should listen to me. I'm sure you understand that. I mean, uh, tell my kids. Anyway, so, but the vote against her was five to one. And uh, th that was kind of a revelation to me. People didn't want to take a chance on her. And, you know, when I realized, why don't they want to take a chance? And what some of the people in the admissions committee said, well, if you look at the people who succeed here, they all, you know, they have GREs over 650. And, you know, I mean, her GREs are, are, don't cut it. And she's not, she probably won't succeed. And you know, I said, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's true that students who succeed in their program have GREs over 650, I'll tell you why. You don't admit people with GREs under 650. So <laughs> they never get a chance. It's, it's a, a little like, I mean, to use a slightly 
bizarre analogy. It's a little like if you go to an elevator and it's already lit and you press the button, you know, if you keep pressing, it'll come. And so the conclusion you could draw is that pressing a lot of times on a lit button really works, but it would have come anyway. But since you always go, if you're in a hurry and press it, you, you, your superstition becomes confirmed, self-confirming hypothesis. I, I mean, I'm wearing a necklace around my neck. It has a religious medal on it. My parents gave it to me when I was young. And they told me it would bring me good luck. And the truth is, it's very hard for me to take it off. Now, because my luck, I think, has generally been pretty good. And I don't know that the metal had anything to do with it, but I'm not going to take the chance. You know, I mean, it's very risky to take the thing off. And then if everything falls apart, it may be, I might be dead. So what happens with superstitions is once you have this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in place, it's hard, it's hard to let it go. And I think part of the mission of a land-grant institution is to go beyond you know, just the test scores, which are basically measures of analytical skills and memory skills, and look at these creative skills that are so important if you're talking about developing active citizen leaders who are going to change the world. You can't do it just on the basis of SAT scores alone. And that, I see, is critical to the land-grant mission. Uh, so Barbara worked for me for two years, and uh, she was great. I mean, she was just terrific. And then two years later, she was admitted as the top pick to the program. But for every Barbara who's given it a chance at a place like Yale, there are an awful lot, you know, probably another 99 out of 100 and never get a chance. So what I see a land grant is distinguishing itself for is saying, you know, we really care about this kind of creative thinking. And we're going to try to get those kids in and not just say that, well, you know, they don't have the paper credentials that Alice has, so we're not going to give them a chance. And then I'll just mention there was a third student who applied to our program who I call Celia. Uh, and Celia's GREs were good but not great, and her letters were good but not great, and her grades were good but not great. So we accepted her because every program needs some people who are good but not great. You know, that's, you have a bell curve, you know, you've heard of the bell curve. That's the only way you can get a bell curve, to have a lot of people in the middle. So you need people like her as sort of stocking stuffers. So we admitted Celia, and I figured, well, she's, you know, she'll be okay. And as a student, it, it turned out we were right. We, we predicted correctly. She was good, but not great. Uh, and again, I, this, it, in these days, I was like, you know, in my early 30s, so I... I just had wrong ideas, what can I say? Now all my ideas, of course, are wrong, too. So, uh, but the interesting thing about Celia is that she went on the job market, she got eight interviews, and she got every job. And I thought, wow, I mean, like, you know, Alice didn't get every job, Barbara didn't get every job, how did she do that? And what I realized when I look back on her career is that she was really good at something else, which is also the essence of a land-grant institution, and that is common sense. She wasn't just, you know, she wasn't the best student academically, but practically she was really smart. She could go into an interview, figure out what they were looking for, and she could become that person. And so she got all the jobs. And then I realized, well, it sort of was the basis for my theory of intelligence, but that's not what the talk today is about. But when you look at a land-grant university, that's another thing that a land-grant university really values. The kinds of practical skills that in some elite private institutions are almost poo-pooed. Um, when I was a dean, there was a group of faculty members who said, you know, our, our, we, that's just not what we're about as a university. We're developing sort of this kind of abstract thinking and a uh, life of the mind, and that sort of leadership stuff and practical stuff, that just is not what we're about. So, so it's, it's kind of a different mentality of what you're valuing. I think that the evaluation of scholarship and research also takes a particular cast in a land-grant institution. Uh, and that is that doing work that makes a difference to society can be viewed as very positively. Uh, when I was at Yale, I um, 
started a center called the Center for the Psychology of Abilities, Competencies, and Expertise. And as is true in many psychology departments today, I don't think it's anything about Yale, uh, the fact that we were actually trying to understand how we could improve people's abilities and make a difference to their lives was seen as, hmm, that's not what psychology is about. I mean, you're supposed to be doing lab research where you have people come in and do experiments. And so I eventually went into a building running the center outside the department. And I don't think it's much different in a lot of other elite psychology departments. I don't think that's a story about Yale. Uh, and what I came to realize is that my belief in the modifiability of abilities and the breadth of abilities was kind of a misfit. I mean, it wasn't the kind of, you know, do this lab research that may have no practical applications. Uh, that many psychology departments value today. So I think that research and scholarship in a land-grant institution has a somewhat different cast, where work that has implications for the betterment of society and that can make a difference is actually valued rather than looked at with suspicion. Sixth, I think service and outreach also have a different meaning in a land-grant institution. Uh, and even teaching does, and that is, that instead of being viewed as, well, you know, what we're looking at is your research, and then if you've done services, it's a check. Uh, when, when I was on promotion and tenure committees at Yale, I can't remember us ever actually discussing teaching and service. Maybe it's changed. But in a land-grant institution, things that might be viewed as kind of really peripheral to the evaluation I think becomes central. And finally, in a land-grant institution, there's much more emphasis on give back. That give back to society rather than being viewed as suspicious or as you know, something, a, a, an extra, is viewed as essential. So that's a little bit about some of the general principles. And what I'd like to do is talk about how they're applied, how you actually do this. So, what, what got me into administration was that I did a project when I was at Yale, it was called the Rainbow Project. So I'm going to start with admissions. And the, here was the idea that, you know, we have, this, we have tests like the SAT and the ACT, and we, we can measure creative and practical abilities. So why don't we do that? I mean, why are we just admitting kids for this very narrow segment of abilities and looking at it as fixed when we could admit them more broadly for the kinds of skills that matter in terms of being an ethical leader who will really make a difference to the world. So we started a project called the Rainbow Project and we devised tests of creative and practical thinking. So what do I mean by that? Well, a test of creative thinking might be that uh, you have to tell a story, like you're given a title like The End of MTV or Confessions of a Middle School Bully or the mysterious laboratory. And so you're given maybe a dozen titles and you would write a, story, a creative story on a couple of them. Or it might be that you're shown a cartoon and you have to caption it. Or it might be that you're shown a collage where you see some pictures, say, of musicians or athletes or whatever, and you have to tell a creative story about it. Uh, or you might be given some words, uh, unrelated words, and be told to create a story. Or you might be asked to draw an artwork at uh, the beginning of time, or Earth from an insect's point of view. Uh, or you might be asked to design a scientific experiment on something that you think is really interesting. So those would be some kinds of measures for creativity. And then practical measures, some of the things we used to look at the sort of the Celia-like abilities. So the creative stuff is the Barbara-like stuff. And practical skills we had to look at, you would look at, say, a movie. And in the movie, you would see a student going to a party. And he looks around, he doesn't know anybody. And he's sort of puzzled as to what to do. And then the movie stops, and you have to say what he should do. Or you might see a movie about a student going in to ask a professor for a letter of recommendation. And then the professor looks up and it's obvious that the professor doesn't know who the student is. What should he do? Or in another one, some students want to get a bed up a winding staircase and they realize it doesn't fit. How did they get the bed upstairs? Or another thing you might do uh, is ask them, have you ever persuaded somebody of something they didn't initially believe? 
uh, how did you persuade them uh, to change their minds? Uh, or you might be given some everyday problems and asked to solve them. So in the Rainbow Project, we did the study in uh, 15 colleges and universities, well, high school around the country, that ranged from very unselective to very selective. They were in all parts of the country. And it was based on this notion of abilities as modifiable rather than fixed, as broad rather than narrow, and as an institution looking for students who are more than just book smart. And so what we found was that it worked. Uh, the, if you looked at our tests relative to the SAT, they actually doubled prediction of first year GPA, so they greatly increased academic prediction. They substantially decreased ethnic group differences. So the SAT shows pretty large ethnic group differences, and we didn't eliminate them, but we decreased them substantially. And if you did statistical analysis, you could separate out creative and practical factors from the sort of more memory and analytical factor. So the results were really good. They were published by what was the top journal in the field, and then we had been funded by the college board. And they said, well, great results. Uh, we're cutting your funding off. So that was a blow. You know, that wasn't what we expected. I thought we were going to get the real big money now. Uh, and they, they said they were cutting the funding because you can't upscale it. I mean, this is small time stuff. So this was a real big career challenge for me. I'd been at Yale now 30 years, and we had these great results, and I thought we could really make a difference in the way we admit students, and we lost our funding. Uh, and that's when I decided to go into administration. So I went to Tufts as a dean, and we instituted the Kaleidoscope Project. And the idea was, instead of doing it just as an experiment, we would actually change the way we did admissions. So after, from my second year on, in Kaleidoscope, every student applied to, as an undergraduate, had an opportunity to do these analytical, creative, practical, and we had, that my theory had then expanded to wisdom-based measures. So now we're also looking at questions like, do you have some kind of passion in high school that you could see uh, in later life uh, making the world a better place? And how might you do that? So now it was based on analytical, Alice-like abilities, creative, Barbara-like abilities, Celia-like abilities, which are practical, and then wisdom-based abilities. So now it, we did this for a few years. We got tens of thousands of cases. It was optional. You didn't have to do it. And the people who did it were mostly ones who were neither clear admits nor clear rejects. So if you, were, if you had a great academic record, you'd probably get in anyway. If you had a terrible academic record, you probably wouldn't get in. But the ones who did Kaleidoscope were ones who tended to be on the fence. So a lot of people were afraid. I spent a year trying to convince people that you know, this isn't going to dilute the quality of the students here. I mean, a lot of professors like high SAT students because they're easy to teach. And there was a lot of fear that, oh, no, gosh, you're going to actually admit people who do well in these other things, and the SATs are going to go down, and we'll get losers, and they'll have pointy heads. Uh, and it turned out to be the opposite. The SATs went up. Uh, and the reason for that is that creative, practical, and wisdom-based abilities are m modestly correlated with analytical abilities. There's this sort of con false conception that there's a negative correlation. It's just not true. But the, co the correlation is modestly positive. So SATs went up, and we got better applicants. And the reason we got better applicants is that some of the people who really weren't interested in Tufts or who just weren't very good, saw these new questions on the application, just decided not to apply. Too much of a pain in the neck. So we got better applicants, and the ones who came were stronger. And what we found is that Kaleidoscope correlated positively with first-year academic success. It improved prediction over SATs and ACTs. But it did something that the SATs and ACTs didn't do, and that is it predicted extracurricular leadership success. And if you think in land-grant terms, that matters just as much as academic success. 
Uh, and it essentially eliminated ethnic group differences. It, so it was more powerful than Rainbow had been in terms of uh, eliminating ethnic group differences. So it incre increased the diversity of the students coming to Tufts with, without decreasing academic skills, but rather increasing skills. And finally, the students really liked it. Uh, they felt it gave a broader conception of what they could do. So then uh, we did that for a few years. Then I went to Oklahoma State as provost. And Oklahoma State is very different from Tufts. And Oklahoma State is just, you know, the ability range is much broader. And the question is, can you use this? This kind of model is really custom made for a land grant institution, but will it work with students who uh, sort of are broader range of traditional analytical abilities? So we started what we called the Panorama Project at Oklahoma State, uh, and it worked just as well at Oklahoma State as it worked at Tufts. So one of the things you, you want to do in a land-grant institution is broaden your notion of abilities. And these kinds of admissions devices are a way of sort of being true to the land-grant mission of, and not just talking about it, but admitting students who have the creative and practical and wisdom-based skills that can help fulfill the mission of give back of a land-grant institution. The next question then was, what if you admit the students and then you just teach them exclusively in traditional ways? Or are you setting them up to fail? In other words, let's say you admit creative students and then you, all of your teaching and assessment is very traditional. Uh, will you end up with students who look good when you admitted them but can't succeed in the academic program? So one of the things we did. Uh, both at Tufts and at Oklahoma State. At Tufts, we started a program for professors called the Center for Enhancement of Learning and Teaching. And the idea was that, look, you know, we're going to be taking students who have a broader range of abilities. Some are more creative, some are more analytical, some are more practical, some are more into sort of wisdom-based thinking. Can you teach in ways that better meet the needs of the students. And this was based on some research I'd done at Yale, which showed that if you teach in a way that enables students better to capitalize on their strengths and to compensate for or correct their weaknesses, they will outperform the way they would achieve if they were taught in just traditional ways. So what we did is we incentivized professors participating in CELT. We called it CELT. Uh, Celtics, you know, Boston Celtics, it was supposed to catch their interest. Uh, we incentivized it either by giving them financial compensation or a teaching reduction. And, uh, and it was a very successful program. And what it enabled us to do is change the way that some of the professors were teaching and assessing so that the students we were admitting could have greater success when they came to Tufts. So it, was something we could do both in terms of teaching and in terms of assessment. And you know, why, why is this sort of, just to go back, why do I have such a personal stake in this? Because in a way, I was one of those kids. I mean, that's, I think when it comes to research careers, I've always gotten into things I do badly. Uh, when I was a kid, I did poorly on IQ tests. And the result was that my you know, my teachers thought I was stupid. There, there was this woman who would come in to give these group IQ tests. This was back in the 1950s, before most of you were born. Um, and uh, she was very scary. I don't know if any of you knew her. Uh, but she really scared me. I mean, there's nothing wrong with her. It was my perception. But I, I became very anxious, and I blew the test. And so my teachers thought I was stupid. I thought I was stupid. I did stupid work. Uh, my teachers were happy. I did st stupid work because their expectations were met. I was happy. They were happy. And everyone was pretty happy. And so what ended up happening is that it created this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I was a pretty mediocre student for the first few years of school. And then in fourth grade, I had a teacher, Mrs. Alexa, who thought that there's more to a kid than just their IQ test score. And that was novel at the time. I mean, she actually thought there was more a person than an SAT or an ACT or 
you know, a test score. And she had very high expectations for me, and I really liked her. I, I mean, a lot. Uh, she was married, and I, she, she was old. Uh, it, but, you know, I had plans for us if things <laughs> went the way I hoped. And so she, she had really high expectations for me. I wanted to make her happy, so I became an A student. Uh, and I got out of this sort of self-defeating cycle of self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, and then, so it looked good, you know? I mean, it looked like I was, you know, I, I was on the road to success. And that ended very quickly my freshman year uh, when I took introductory psychology. And it was a straight memorize the book course, which many introductory courses are. And, um, you know, the first test was the 10 point test, and the guy handed out the test in descending order. So we started with the tens and then the nines, and I figured, well, I couldn't, maybe I got an eight. He handed out the eights and then the sevens. I figured, obviously, my paper got out of order. Uh, and the sixes, the fives, the fours. Then he got to the threes and he handed me my paper. And he said, you know, there's a famous Sternberg in psychology, and it's obvious there won't be another one. So that was a bummer. Uh, and I, I had wanted to major in psychology because I did poorly on IQ tests, and I wanted to understand why I was so stupid. <laughs> there goes my talk. Uh, it, it's been good talking to you. Thank you. No. Uh, so, so, uh, so I decided to switch to math, uh, which was a great idea because I got 35 on the midterm and uh, course on real analysis. I still don't know what real analysis is, <laughs> even though I took half the course. So the teacher recommended I drop that course. So I switched back to psychology. Uh, and then I, I actually did pretty well in the upper level courses. And then, you know, I later chaired the department at Yale and became president of the American Psychological Association. But it's sort of lesson, and I tell this to my students in 1150, I teach the introductory course in human development. I think they sometimes have trouble believing me. I say, well, you know, if you get a C in this course, it works for me. Uh, it, it just doesn't make that much difference. And I think, I think where the opportunity of land-grant institutions is, is to get away from the notion that, uh, that is very narrowly academic, that, you know, you want to get good grades in high school, to get into a good college, and then you want to get good grades in college to get into a good graduate school, and then you want to get good grades in graduate school to get a good job, and then you want to get good grades on the job to keep getting promoted and uh, to get go to heaven instead of hell. And I, I see a land-grant institution as having a broader mission than that, that we want to develop ethical leaders who are creative and coming up with new ideas who were analytic in being able to ascertain whether they're good ideas, who are practic so they're creative like Barbara, they're analytic like Alice, they're practical like Celia in that they can apply their ideas and persuade other people of the value of those ideas, and they are wise in being able to apply their abilities and their knowledge for a common good by balancing their own uh, intrapersonal interests, their own interests with other people's interests, with sort of broader societal and world interests uh, in order to make the world a better place. And uh, I think that Cornell has gone a long way toward achieving that, and I hope that other universities will follow that kind of a lead. So that's kind of what I thought I'd talk about, and if there are comments or questions, I'd be glad to take those. Yeah. Yeah, oops, I seem to be dropping stuff. Um, first it was my talk, now it's my glasses. Uh, I usually drop my wallet at the end, and that's a really good opportunity for someone whose salary is not where they want it to be. Uh, so a lot of the work we've done is actually at the primary, secondary level. And the idea is that, for example, in teaching, you can teach for analytical, say, creative and practical thinking. So if you take, like, literature, you can have uh, students compare and contrast two characters, uh, you know, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, or they could compare and contrast two novels, or they could analyze the plot of a novel, 
or they could judge a literary work, or they could critique an essay. Those would be analytical skills. Uh, but, and they can apply analysis to artwork. They can apply analysis to science, and analyze a scientific experiment or a theory. Uh, but they can also be creative in any field. So they can do creative writing or creative art. Or in science, they can create their own experiment. I remember doing these labs when I was in elementary and secondary school where it, they were very non-scientific. They just say, first you do this, then you do this, then you do that. They, instead of, why don't you think of a phenomenon you're interested in and come up with your own experiment? Uh, you can do creative work in math in terms of uh, either creating your own math problems or creating novel numerical systems, which is something we have done with students. You can do creative work in history. Uh, imagine, you know, suppose that the Nazis had war won World War II, what would the world be like today? Uh, or suppose that the American Revolution had failed, what would the wor be world be like today? So you can apply creative ideas in your teaching, or you can apply practical ideas, but you seem to have a follow-up question. Right. The only way Cornell does that, but Noah Langrath is the the boom of diversifying the population of your students to include a wide variety. Right. Well, there are two ways you can make it count. The first is that you can actually test for those things. So when one of the studies we did, uh, we took adva three advanced placement tests, for example, uh, advanced placement psychology, statistics, and physics. And we added creative and practical items to those tests. And uh, you can measure this stuff with good statistical properties. Uh, we also created achievement tests for younger kids. So one thing you can do is add test items that measure creative and practical skills. But the other question, which I think schools are more concerned about, is given the pressures of the No Child Left Behind Act, what good is all this stuff? It's a bunch of crap if their test scores are going to go down. So our view was, well, if you go back to uh, this theory of successful intelligence I have, the basic idea, a basic idea of the theory is that students learn best if they're able to capitalize on their strengths and compensate for correct weaknesses. So the question then was, if you just use conventional standardized tests, Will students do better if they learn in a way that better suits their profile of abilities and sort of styles of thinking? And so what our research has shown is that they generally do. That even if your goal is just to do better on a standardized test, if you're learning the material in a way that suits the way you naturally learn, you do better. So for example, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I took foreign language. I took French in high school. And my teacher one day, uh, her name was Mrs. Brown, but in order to disguise her identity, we'll call her Mrs. Green. Uh, so Mrs. Green said to me one day, just as an offhanded comment, that I can see from the kinds of errors you're making that you don't have much foreign language learning ability, but you're doing fairly well in the course just as a function of being a smart student which I thought was funny given my crummy IQ test scores when I was a kid. Uh, what did she know? But after she said that, I never took another foreign language course because I didn't want to screw my future up by doing badly in the courses. And then I wouldn't get into college or graduate school when I'd go to prison and bad things like that. So I never took another foreign language course. And then when I was an assistant professor, I had an opportunity to do some research in Venezuela. And this was before things kind of changed there. Uh, they had a ministry for the development of intelligence. And it was a chance to devise a program to help kids improve their cognitive skills. So I needed to learn Spanish. And by now I was you know, in my late 20s. I so I started learning Spanish with a tutor. And one day, my Spanish tutor said to me, you know, you really have a lot of foreign language learning ability. You're just doing great in Spanish. Well, I thought, that's funny, because Mrs. Green, uh, also, AKA Mrs. Uh, White, uh, had said that I don't have much foreign language ability. And the difference was the way they taught it. 
it wasn't the way they tested it. It's that Mrs. Green taught what's called by the, what's called the mimic and memorize method. You know, you hear a phrase, you repeat it, you expand it, you hear another phrase, you mimic, you memorize. And my Spanish teacher taught by a learning from context method. Knowing that I was going to be going to Venezuela, uh, it was like place yourself in Venezuela and deal with real situations. So I learned better one way than another. So the idea is by teaching in ways that are responsive to the way the students learn, they do better regardless of how they are tested. Are there other questions I can answer? Yeah, Steve. Okay. Um, I've noticed that there are non-land grant literacies that seem to me to exemplify the land grant ideal, perhaps even better than those mm -hmm. land grant universities in the sense that they uh, they educate a diverse population, they serve their communities, they conduct research that yeah. makes a difference in people's lives. One is an urban university. What do you think of that? Uh, I think that the name really doesn't make much difference. They're land grant universities. I've actually talked about this that are land grants in name only. Uh, I was, when I was at Oklahoma State, I talked about one uh, in a nearby state that was so concerned with competing with the main state university that the land grant part was kind of getting lost. Uh, and they're land grants that accept kids pretty much by SATs or grades, and that's the end of the story. Uh, they're land grants where they'll talk about the service mission, but then if you do any service, you can forget about getting tenure. So I don't think the name matters. In fact, in a book I have just submitted to Cornell University Press called What Universities Could Be, uh, I've started using the term, uh, a different term. It doesn't matter what the term is. But the point, the reason I'm using a different term is because some land grant, some schools that are called land grants aren't really except the name, and some that aren't called that really are. So I, I call them Excel universities, but that's a different book, and I don't want to get into that now. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. I work here at Marin Library, and I think a lot about our role in supporting a fertile learning environment. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll give you an example. When I was provost, I taught a course called The Nature of Leadership. And it had a, first of all, it had a service learning component. So every student in the course did, I think it was 10 hours of service learning as part of the course. And then they had an assignment based on the service learning. And they had to do an oral report on how what they learned in the service tied in with what they're learning in the course. Uh, and also, every class I had an outside speaker come in who was a leader uh, and talk about leadership from the standpoint of actually being a leader. How did he get or she get from being a student to being a class leader? Uh, and I partly did it for fundraising, actually, because we then raised money from the people who came to the class. But uh, it, that was the part of the class that the students liked the most. It, and so they interacted with the person for an hour. The person only talked for five or ten minutes. And so they got to see how they could apply concepts from the course to real world leadership. Uh, and then there was another component where the students had to do uh, analyses of actual leaders and take the concepts from the course and apply them. So I think that the main thing is making the transition from the academic concepts to how do you use them to become a leader yourself. And that's, that's what I think made the course valuable. We used the textbook, but the textbook wasn't really the center of the course. The center of the course was the transition from how do you learn from the textbook to how do people actually do this stuff in their lives. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah.
Uh -huh. how you use that term in the first season. Yeah. And I know you were talking about the three sport, the three granite students, um, and then there's some concerns, but I'm wondering, you know, the other side about adult education and non-degree um, students and the yeah. role of land grants. Well, I think that uh, it, for, land, for land grants, you usually talk about research, teaching, and extension, and extension is a, a genuine third leg, leg of the stool. Uh, so I think that it's extremely important, and when I was talking about in a land grant, it's really important to give back. Extension is one of the main ways you do it. So that I see is really critical. And what I was, when I was talking about the sort of center we ran at Yale, a lot of our work was oriented people and in many elite academic institutions that's looked at with suspicion and I think what distinguishes the land grant is you're kind of doing what I tried to do in that leadership course you're saying it's not enough just to know the stuff uh, you'd have to learn to apply it and one of the sad things I think about our society and this is a good place to end is that we've created a social hierarchy based on test scores so to get into a good undergraduate school, you need the test scores, and then to get into graduate school or postgraduate school or whatever. And so you end up with position, people in positions of leadership often who are good at the memory and analytical skills, but really aren't the best in the creative, practical, wisdom-based, and ethical skills. So I think as a society, the land grant uh, sort of gives us a mission for where we need to go from where we are and we often get people who went to elite universities but put them in positions of leadership and maybe they're not all so well suited. I see it's five o'clock, so thank you very much for coming to the talk. I appreciate your being here. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.